I'll admit everyone else. Can I turn your TV down? Or should I go somewhere else? Turn it down. Okay. All right, welcome everyone. Looks like we've got still people joining us. So this uh, format's a little bit different. Um, I'm Stephanie Aiden with AAA Spokane and we are in a meeting format. Normally we're doing these in a, in a webinar format. And tonight we chose meeting uh, so you all are can be live and in person and uh, conversational and ask questions as they come up. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So um, please plan on doing that. There isn't a Q&A function, but there is a chat function. But I would also just encourage you to just say, hey, I got a question and, and ask it of, of Daniel. So um, we welcome everybody. We've got a, a good sized crowd tonight and um, it's a good time to to really talk about this exciting topic. Um, we're gonna have a conversation on the on design power and, and, the, and the pandemic. Um, this particular um, course does have credit at one uh, learning unit. And if you are an AIA member, please email me at office at AIAspokane.org and I'll make sure and get you credit for tonight. Um, we do have more of that fun factor that we talked about, CSI and uh, Spokane and AI Spokane have come together to do some giveaways. Tonight at the end, we'll be raffling off a $50 gift card to support the Spokane dining scene. And then um, as you attend your different events throughout the, the month, um, we will be tallying the, that attendance and the top 10 people that have attended the most events that are AIA and allied members will win an, an additional $50 gift card um, to the local restaurant scene. So please keep attending, sign up for classes on AIAspokane.org or AIA.org slash Spokane. And I will go through the rest of the events later on tonight after we get finished. So I wanna go ahead and turn it over to Georgia Harder. She has been your um, chair of Architecture Month uh, this, 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 this year. And I wanted to go ahead and introduce our speaker, Daniel McPhee. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I've been really excited for this event and I'm so glad. Um, I'm really thankful for the board members or uh, committee and everyone that's attending this evening. Um, our guest speaker is Daniel McPhee with Ur Urban Design Forum. And I um, really appreciate him staying up a little bit later for uh, or extending his work day on the East Coast to be here with us. Um, while we have all witnessed uh, historic disruptions and challenges because of COVID, uh, there have been some positive changes and, and definitely some new perspectives. Um, this year for Architecture Month, the committee uh, wanted to take this time to reflect and discuss the positive changes in our social, economic and social fab fabric. Um, there's no doubt that the AEC professionals will play and do play a significant role in our community's resilience. And we are part of the framework of our, ability, our community's ability to plan and recover and adapt um, our built environment. Um, initially when setting up this month um, in events, I was researching, you know, the positives that have come out of here um, this crisis and how other cities are moving forward uh, during and after this crisis. And I came across uh, Urban Design Forum based in New York City. Uh, they have provided some, they've had some uh, remarkable achievements this year by collaborating with um, design designers, graphic designers, um, people in law, finance, engineering, public health, uh, and advocating for their community. And they've had rapid, rapid response initiatives like uh, uh, Neighborhoods Now and Power in the Pandemic. And, uh, and they've also been at the forefront of uh, understanding the challenges of rebuilding uh, post-COVID cities and neighborhoods. Um, what we've learned 
and um, how to bring equity into our community and engaging with civil leaders. And um, with that, I would like to turn it over to Daniel. Great, thanks, thanks Stephanie, thanks Georgia. Good evening, Spokane. I can't say that I've ever actually been to your lovely city, but um, I have been somewhat nearby. Uh, I've got a brother out in Bellingham and I've spent a few frightening evenings out in Marble Mount, but I'm told there's uh, usually whining and dining at these kinds of affairs. I'm sorry we don't get to huddle around a dimly lit table together and drink late into the night, uh, grill one another on the value of architecture, but um, I can see some of you are still at work. I can tell probably that some of you are dicing onions. I can tell some of you are probably changing diapers. Um, I've grown entirely accustomed to talking to myself this year and I'm prepared to do it again. So glad to be here. Um, it's it's uh, one of the two great victories of this year to be able to participate in civic and intellectual life from your couch and your sweatpants. Um, the other value of course, is that we get to have a little bit of a complete and total reevaluation of our, of our place in the world. So um, if you've, uh, do we have any kind of New Yorkers in the house or people who have been to New York, love New York, know New York at all? Visited. Cool, sounds good. Um, well, I'm gonna start showing some slides and, and tell you a little bit about the forum and, and what we do here in New York. Give me one second. Great. So um, for the last 10 years, I've worked with a New York City-based group uh, called the Urban Design Forum. It was founded in 1979 by a pioneering woman journalist, Anne Farabee, when New York City was a different beast altogether. Rumor has it that Anne uh, loathed Philip Johnson and was tired of him running architecture, culture, and rooms full of men. And so she was a woman with many brothers. She wanted to change the culture. She wanted to make it interdisciplinary and gather designers and developers, and public officials and activists around a single table. She wanted to defy that usual New York exceptionalism and look to the world for inspiration. And she wanted to gather enthusiasts that love cities and wanted to protect them. I think in building the forum, she also built a club of friends. And 40 years later, the the forum has changed a little, New York has changed a little, and yet we're still difficult to describe. We're not quite a civic association. We're not quite a think tank. We're not a design studio. We're a membership organization, um, a crew of enthusiasts and a club of friends um, that are gearing design to, to address the defining issues of our generation. What we're most famous for is conversation. So I agreed to do this tonight on the, in the hopes that we could preserve some time to, to hear from you and, and see what we could cook up in Spokane, all right? Cool, so um, the forum dove headfirst into community design after the pandemic struck New York City. I'm gonna invite us all to relive a little trauma and go back, go back about 12 months and remember that mix of emotions when we all shut down. But even before that, um, the pandemic shocked New York City before it had even infected its first New Yorker. In Manhattan's Chinatown, which is where our office is situated, fear of the pandemic had devastated uh, local restaurants and retailers in February and drove a rise in anti-Asian hate crime. The first mark of progressive protest was to dine out um, in Chinatown as often as we could, and we delighted in doing so while warily forecasting what might come next. In mid-March, uh, New York City was nearly instantly shut down to avert the loss of life. Of course, we didn't shut down quickly enough, and the, and the city became the worldwide epicenter after Wuhan and Milan before it. We're still trying to figure out exactly why New York City was hit hard and fast. The theories rage on. But one unfortunate thought was that um, it was the use of the subway and that thought has been fortunately debunked. Another was that Northern Italy was actually the top tourist destination for New Yorkers fleeing the cold. But at the end of the day, our electeds didn't wanna look scared. Our public health agencies weren't up to the challenge and we missed our opportunity to lock things down. So. The other challenge, of course, was that overcrowding and a lot of our unaffordable housing would help to spread the disease widely. And in one neighborhood where we're working right now, Jackson Heights, the infection rate actually hit 70% in the first wave. In those dark early days, we had this bright new appreciation for, for the people who kept our city going. Of course, the doctors and the nurses, but also the grocery clerks, the bus drivers, the sanitation workers who helped keep, keep things moving. We called them essential and we clanged pots and pans every night at 7 p.m. in their honor. 
By mid-April, at the peak of the pandemic, we quickly realized that this was not a disease that was treating New Yorkers equally. Our public health system, our public hospital system was overwhelmed and low income neighborhoods, communities of color were particularly devastated. The wealthy fled out to the suburbs as quickly as they could and some Manhattan neighborhoods emptied out by more than a quarter. And yet, you know, New Yorkers kept finding ways to help their neighbors. We had these mutual aid, aid networks reemerge. They were working in Google Docs and transacting via Venmo. People were asking, uh, their neighbors to help deliver groceries or take care of their kids during the workday. And I started to wonder what, if anything, the design community could do beyond clang pots and pans. Could we form our own kind of mutual aid effort to assist our neighbors? As infection rates declined and the science became clear, we were also seeing how wealthy neighborhoods and real estate empires were plotting their reopenings. So we would watch as wealthy neighborhoods recovered faster while underinvested neighborhoods would flail. And so my colleagues with the Van Allen Institute and I came together around this question of what if we centered our reopening strategy on essential workers in hard hit neighborhoods? We began to reach out to community development corporations and business improvement districts in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods, ones that had been really badly hurt from COVID and had no you know, economic crisis end in sight just to see how we could help. In late May, uh, New York was shocked again when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis and the movement for Black Lives was reignited and thousands were marching in masks across New York City. For the first time, it felt like we should leave our houses again. Demonstrators were walking back and forth across the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges. I even took the subway for the first time since the pandemic began to march from Washington Square Park to City Hall. There was some looting, yes, um, in wealthy Soho, which we all read about in the news, but also in neighborhoods like Bed-Stuy and Kingsbridge. And that's when the police imposed a strict 8 p.m. curfew. After curfew, police harassed protesters and anyone outside. They were some of the scariest days that many of us had ever experienced in work. And I recall these demonstrations and the looting and the curfew just to help you understand the moment that we initiated this project. When we reached out to our community partner in the Northwest Bronx, she mentioned she was going to go clean up broken windows from the night before. And our community partner in bed had to postpone our first meeting so she could help board up businesses. In that moment, we felt like we needed a different kind of design practice. One, one that was focused on neighborhoods that had kept us safe during the pandemic, neighborhoods that were unable to access relief, and neighborhoods that had unfairly seen the consequences of looting and police violence. We also had a weak mayor, we had an unsympathetic president, and we needed to find a way to work together. When the initial reopening was announced, we launched Neighborhoods Now to support hard hit neighborhoods to find their reopening strategies. Within about um, a week, we had mobilized about 200 constituents working across 60 different firms to provide pro bono services to five community partners. We thought we'd wrap up in about five weeks, but um, here we are a year later supporting 11 organizations across seven neighborhoods. Mm. I can tell there's kids, which is exactly what I was talking about. This is great. Hey, Badney, it'll go away in two minutes. I'm going to let Georgia figure out the mute situation if possible. Yeah, I got it. Cool. So in order to best identify some of the neighborhoods where we would work, uh, we worked with an outstanding group called the NHD to survey organizations across the city around their on the ground needs. We're working in seven largely low income, black, Latino and Asian neighborhoods that have been subject to centuries of disinvestment. But in many ways, they're the beating heart of the city. They're essential neighborhoods and they make our city exceptional. The model follows this logic. Community organizations tell us what they need in order to reopen safely. We put together a working group of designers. There's a series of wraparound experts from law, finance, engineering, graphic design, and public health supporting each group. We have city agencies that realize that they're not effectively accessing low-income communities of color that are joining our calls to consult. And we orchestrate regular calls to ensure that teams are sharing lessons and bridging relationships. We've also fundraised for the effort, raising about $200,000 to support our community partners. 
We have about 70 firms engaged now in some way. Many are household names um, and others are emerging MWBE firms. Uh, we made sure that we wanted to partner team members with deep experience in the neighborhoods uh, that they worked or maybe some shared lived experience uh, with members of that community. For the purposes of our lecture, I wanted to focus on just three of those partners, um, just to give you a sense of what we were able to, to accomplish. So I'll start with Jackson Heights, um, which is located in North Central Queens. So picture it, it's a uh, barely half the size of Central Park. It's the most culturally diverse neighborhood in New York, if not on the planet, which is what the New York Times said when it, point, when it talked about the crisis. It's home to about 180,000 people speaking 167 languages. It's a gateway to immigrant life in the United States and the true illustration of the promise of our country. When you walk along Roosevelt Avenue, you can find Bengali, Urdu, Hindi, Spanish, all brilliantly displayed across multiple levels of retail. The small businesses generate a lot of remittances to families in other countries and the restaurants are world famous. And nearby, there are some brilliant social housing estates. There's the, the World's Park, uh, the so-called Flushing um, Meadows Corona Park, which tennis fans may recognize from the US Open. And it's not all rosy, of course. It's among the city's most overcrowded neighborhoods. And it was really at the heart of the early COVID crisis. The director of our partner organization, Leslie Ramos, said that everyone knew someone who was sick or had died from the virus. And on one single corner of her business improvement district, three different business owners had died. At the end of the street where she works was Elmhurst Hospital, which was the public facility that lacked the supplies that they needed to make it through the worst of the crisis. This was a community that was reeling from the loss of so many during COVID and now 50% of their, the local businesses were either closed or on the brink of closing. And so many restaurants weren't yet taking advantage of some of these new open air reopening programs because they either lacked information, they were intimidated by the regulatory hurdles or they feared getting fined. So we convened this collaborative team of brilliant emerging firms who immediately put down boots and set up shop. They commandeered this tiny little six foot storefront where they doled out signage, they stored lumber, they consulted with community members and they built trust showing up week after week checking on local businesses, repairing and, re and replanting the neighborhood, dining in the local establishments. And the restaurants really became that team's focus. Um, they didn't have a dollar in their pocket uh, at first, so they borrowed plywood from their construction subcontractors on other projects. They shopped locally for low cost materials and they deployed installations as quickly as they could. So just as the city's restaurant policy was evolving, their their designs evolved with it. And they came up with kind of a nice menu of options translated in multiple languages where they could help people permit or produce. They worked with local artists to infuse neighborhood character onto simple structures. And they ended up working with over 20 restaurants showing up week after week to make sure that they could deal with the problems as they emerged. I really admire this team because they recognize that you can't do community design from behind a desk and they certainly couldn't do it by invading a neighborhood either. And so they found a local carpenter uh, who could build each of their projects. And you can see him here at the end of a long night um, using scraps to build a table for a young man. It didn't matter that they didn't have all the right resources. It didn't matter that they didn't have all the right ideas. It was that they showed up week after week and continued to. The city's obviously reaching this new equilibrium, uh, but their dedication hasn't wavered. They're you know, helping a local bookstore build out a new backyard and some street seats. They're preparing for the return of the local food festival, Viva La Comida, this summer. And they've even designed a memorial for some of the essential workers lost at Elmhurst Hospital that they hope might someday be built. We'll go next to my home borough, Brooklyn. Uh, we supported two different organizations um, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, which we all call bed which covers a, a great swath of central Brooklyn. It's a historically black neighborhood with beautiful streets of gorgeous brownstones and sidewalk gardens. They often garner the kind of most beautiful block of Brooklyn award, which is um, highly esteemed. And one of the central corridors, Fulton Street has the highest concentration of black owned businesses across the city. So yes, it's lined with all your modern conveniences, your banks, your pharmacies, your restaurants, 
but it also has beauty supply stores, clothing stores, barber shops, nail salons, all of these businesses that weren't allowed to reopen in the same way. On the right, you can see the, the, the central public space, Restoration Plaza, which looks pretty uninspired at the moment. The whole facility that surrounds it is, is managed by Brooklyn's first community development corporation. And it's got this powerhouse of shops and spaces for social services like food pantries and tax prep and all these kinds of things. Right now it's a vaccination site. And so this plaza, which had been undergoing a major rethink, um, also provided us an opportunity to think about how residents could safely reconvene with the right program. bed was rocked, um, not only by the pandemic and its economic impacts, but because it was the central gathering place for many of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. So it's a place where we sort of witnessed the incredible promise of the present day civil rights movement but also, also where we witnessed what kind of flimsy symbolism could do to a community. So you can see this mural on the left commemorating Black Lives Matter. It was painted by city government um, and it helped to pedestrianize the thoroughfare, but it actually had pretty mixed outcomes. People were afraid to walk on it. People were afraid to come through the corridor and it actually hurt foot traffic in the, in the, in the corridor and hurt a lot of local businesses. We worked with a local bid um, and the Community Development Corporation on so many issues. The team leapt into a digital engagement strategy. They set up meetings with local community leaders and elected officials. They did focus groups over Zoom. And they even made these beautiful comics to help people figure out how to safely navigate the neighborhood and this complex in particular. Our team wasn't just thinking about queuing and protective services. They were also working with a graphic designer to develop some signage that actually reflects the neighborhood's demographics. So they had volunteers from the neighborhood offer their likenesses. They kind of drew inspiration from the Women's March imagery and developed a signage approach that proudly boasts the neighborhood's Black and Muslim identities. There's a wide array of social services provided at Restoration Plaza. So the public space became the site to negotiate queuing, of course, but also of healing. Uh, so a landscape firm helped to develop this colorful wayfinding system that would help people make their way through the facility, but also enjoy a pause or maybe some new plant life. The team has been drawing and redrawing their plans for the plaza as the reopening strategy continues to change. You know, a few months ago, they were working on how to get all these people in, involved uh, because the, all the tax preparation that would have to take place on the site, apparently that's a big use there. And right now they're actually managing a lot of the vaccination lines um, and queuing. One of the more hopeful plans is to drape six foot squares across the plazas and work with local artists to remember some of the people we lost while also bringing people back together for movie nights and, and yoga classes and other, and other gatherings. You can take a, take a peek at what they're painting so far. We're helping you know, retailers get what they need. We set up this great winter market uh, complete with Santa behind plexiglass so that kids wouldn't miss a Christmas. And they've done all sorts of things that are harder to photograph. They've hosted clinics that help manage rent challenges between landlords and tenants. They're working through longstanding building violations with local mosque. They're doing work that's not just reactive and urgent. They're, they're taking a look at some of the challenges that lie ahead for the neighborhood as well. We can end in the Bronx. Um, the Bronx may be uh, New York's greenest borough actually, but it's one of our most challenged. It ranks 62nd out of 62 counties. So dead last for the worst community health outcomes across New York state. And it has enormously high rates of asthma and diabetes and obesity, all of which of course compounded mortality in the, in the pandemic. So our, communities, our community partner described it as the epic center of the epicenter. I think a lot of us know the Bronx because of its challenging history, right? There's the decade of fire in the 1970s that nearly leveled whole census tracts. And that was the result of deliberate disinvestment, the closing of fire companies, the lack of lending to tenants in which banks um, described uh, this was a declining neighborhood and not worthy of investment. But in that decade of fire was this incredibly inspiring organization you know, organizing movement born 
that's now fighting for community ownership of real estate. The Northwest Bronx is also um, feeling some of the intensifying pressures of gentrification and unaffordability. We worked largely along Kingsbridge Road, uh, which is a service corridor of immigrant small businesses. The neighborhood abuts Fordham Road, which is kind of like the heart of the Northwest Bronx. It's one of the liveliest neighborhoods in New York City and its bus line actually carries more than a lot of our subway lines. But the tale of two cities really can be deeply felt here. This is a working neighborhood separated by a highway from some of the most well-heeled neighborhoods of New York. Fieldston, Riverdale, these might be household names uh, to some of you. I can only imagine that the community board meetings are very strange, but this is like truly the illustration of the tale of two cities. There was uh, this major building on the, in the back left is called the Kingsbridge Armory. And a couple of years ago, it was rezoned as a series of ice skating rinks. And it was about as contentious a process as it possibly could have been. And it's only worried us more because it's really starting to drive speculation and, and, and drive up land value. So a lot of the businesses that have managed to hang on often operate without leases and face the continuing threat of eviction. The neighborhood only got 1% of the municipal stimulus um, small business support after the pandemic. So our team surveyed the neighborhood for urgent needs, but our community partner was really savvy and she understood that a team of planners, of designers, lawyers, CDFIs could actually be focused on really long-term strategy. But first I have to show you one of my favorite pictures, which is a restaurant that they built, um, Tropical Rotisserie. They worked with local artists and they brought some salsa back to the Bronx. So much of their analysis was not focused on restaurant openings, but on real hard policy. The team was surveying every vacant building in the neighborhood. They were coming up with different opportunities for homes and gardens and plazas that would be owned by the community in what are called community land trusts. They're also working to revive a merchants association to better organize tenants and fight eviction. They're working to achieve uh, accreditation as a good maintenance partner from the city, which would enable them to close streets to private cars and activate public space with pop-up programming. So we're excited. There's some brilliant art and lighting installations on their way someday. <laughs> but most of the work is actually hard to illustrate. We're just you know, a small drop in the bucket of helping New York City recover from the pandemic. We only served about hundred businesses, but I think we have the seed here of what I like to think is a holistic embrace of a neighborhood. Design, law, finance, public health, all aligning in service of community development. I believe the great promise of the design community right now is to empower underinvested communities to shape their own futures. Let them lead and provide the tools and the resources that they need to thrive. We're uh, still swimming with a lot of tough questions about this project and maybe you can even help me with a couple, especially the one on the bottom right, which is how can we build community design directly into our business practices it's like the law field has done. Maybe we can return all that in, in just a second, but. All to say our work isn't done. You know, we're helping a coalition of 40 cultural organizations figure out how to operate safely in and outdoors this summer and help artists who have been so damaged by the pandemic and bring New York City back to life. We're reactivating a series of community gardens that provide space for social services and community organizing. And we're returning to Chinatown to spruce up a bearing plaza with art, cultures, and some stalls that are incubating small businesses and restaurants. So I think if we can achieve even half of all that, I think it'll have been a year well spent. So thank you very much for inviting me and I'd love to kind of welcome your questions and ideas and conversation. Thank you, Daniel. That was uh, really great to hear. Um, I had a question about um, funding. How did you uh, manage to fundraise to support um, all of these projects? So we didn't have a dollar when we got started, which was maybe a little bit of a mistake. Fortunately, there were a number of community foundations and, and sort of branch banks that were located in those neighborhoods that were very generous with some of the COVID relief funding. I think they recognized that 
neighborhood stabilization is super important. And if we lose some of those anchor tenants, those anchor businesses, we actually damage our whole city. And because of some of the challenges that were faced around immigrant communities in particular, a lot of foundations were trying to figure out how can they actually get relief to some of those businesses and organizations. So that's sort of where we found opportunity. The way that we fundraised was we actually raised um, about $400,000 over the course of the project and we gave half directly to our community partners. So we granted them just cash to do what they needed to do. Sometimes they gave it directly to the design team, sometimes they spent it themselves, but that's sort of how we, we managed to do a lot of this. Thanks, Daniel. That was that was fantastic. Um, I was curious, how do you encourage uh, or, or facilitate kind of the community conversations um, when members may be unfamiliar or, or skeptical of kind of an outside group coming in and, and doing something that they're not, a, not aware of? I guess, how do you get that buy in and, and uh, support? Yeah, that was a really tough question, actually. At the first couple of weeks was just like, how do you even build trust, right? A lot of these people, sometimes they'd worked in the neighborhood, maybe they'd worked on the project. But for the most part, a lot of people were new to these neighborhoods. So, you know, we tried to kind of encourage them to earn trust by showing up week after week. They would walk around with their community partners. They'd introduce themselves as architects who could do these various services. They introduced themselves as lawyers that could help with these various things. And no one really called them. So we just sort of said, okay, go back next week, go back next week. And it turned out over time, you know, it just, it kind of took like one project at a time. You know, there was like that one first restaurant in Jackson Heights that built out on the street. And then everyone was like, hey, can I get one of those? How can I, you know, how can I work with you guys to do this? And it's amazing. Like every new restaurant, someone else says, oh, that one looks great. Can I, can I work with you on this? Some of the like, um, in bed for instance, we did a lot of digital engagement. So working with a lot of the local elected officials, things like that, they were much more willing to use Zoom and Facebook Live. They had like, 800 people call into a single Facebook Live. So like people were really engaged um, in that process. So, you know, what I encourage people to do is like meet people where they are. You know, if, if that's in the grocery store, maybe you actually do some consulting in the grocery store. If it's the bank, go check out the bank, put out, put out your flyers. And that's the kind of ways that we started to just build trust. Along those lines, I was curious, um, <clears throat> you seem to have a really clear vision and purpose to what you're doing. Uh, it seems really clear in your mind. And some of these neighborhoods, um, larger cities are so diversified. There's so many groups and different people. It's, it's such a, it seems like a monster task to start to start to take on. I was curious how many of these groups you had relationships prior to COVID or people in your office and with your organization had. And if there was a pretty high level of working with <clears throat> your architects and engineers and lawyers and uh, other agencies, like how often do you coordinate in order to drive this sort of a task forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, first of all, we, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, we were on the Zoom every week. You know, we were just talking as much as we could, sharing ideas, getting work done. Nowadays, we're actually more on monthly calls just to check in and make sure that they're all advancing. The challenge, of course, is like, who speaks for a community, right? Um, especially like, you know, we have 167 languages spoken in Jackson Heights. And so, you know, I had a couple of pre-existing relationships with some of the local bids and things like that, people who had spoken at the forum before um, but for the most part, they were all fresh. They were all new to us. Um, and I think it was, you know, we scratched our head a little bit, like, how can we do this in a responsible way? But, you know, we worked with this great organization that's like a community development group that just brings together those kinds of organizations that are doing work around community development across the city. And we just wrote to them and said, what do you need? Do you need help thinking about ventilation? Do you need help building out restaurants? And we were pretty amazed to see that people just wrote us back and said, great, like, we'll take advantage. So I think there was a little bit of like, okay, the matchmaking game was really the, the, the challenging part. It was less like finding the partners. It was a little bit more about like, how do you do this responsibly? How do you kind of pair the right firms to the right people? Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna pretend we always had it right. Even if we had a good vision, <laughs> you know, there were some teams that didn't gel as well, but um, for the most part, I'm pretty amazed. I think like this crisis really did bring people together and work across coalitions. And 
I think it was just, it was that combination of the pandemic, the economics and the racial justice moment that everyone was sort of immersed in together. And also we had been trapped in our houses for three months. So it was like, we wanna get back out there and we wanna kind of serve our neighborhoods. So that's kind of how we got, came to the initial partners. With that in mind, what do you see as uh, permanently transformative out of these efforts like post COVID? Uh, what's going to be different than before? Yeah, so it's funny, like we started this as a six week sprint, right? So we thought we were just going to be helping people, you know, put out the duct tape and the plexiglass and all that. It certainly evolved beyond that. And I think what's really exciting is some of the later projects, like they realize they can actually not just work on, you know, duct tape and plexiglass, right? This, that's no longer the problem. We've already sort of adjusted to this new reality. And so I think, you know, the real promise is just like, how do we keep building these teams? and make sure that every neighborhood of New York actually has access to the same kinds of assets and tools and resources that like Union Square or the Meatpacking District or Midtown Manhattan would have. So I think, you know, we're still waiting to see. It's only been, you know, 10 months since we got started. <laughs> so we'll see what's permanent. Um, I think a lot of this ticky tacky architecture is gonna dissipate, but um, I think actually some of the alliances that were formed are gonna be enduring. Um, we have a question in, um, what would you do differently? That's a great question. Uh, we probably would have figured out how to raise the money first, <laughs> if possible. It was good to actually have some cash and capital to like really get projects started. Um, so that was something that was really important to us. I think the other thing was like, one of the challenges is that like the design community it, it's afforded a certain level of education and opportunity and means that oftentimes architects are working for big clients, institutional partners, major developers, and are often also located in just a few neighborhoods of New York, right? They're actually not super connected to the various different boroughs and the various different neighborhoods. And so I think one of the challenges that we're up against is like, if we really want these solutions to come from the communities, yes, we should work with a community partner. Yes, we should do engagement, but also could we find the local designers, the local artists, the people that could really help us make these projects, not our own, but, but really of the community. So I think that's one thing that we're trying to think about differently is like, how can we really foster that kind of participation early in the process, make sure that they're the ones actually leading the teams and that the you know big giant mega firms of the city are actually working in support of those of those individuals and those practices. Were there a project team? Is there like a, a project team size that you found was kind of ideal? Like did it did you need a, a certain number of people to kind of reach a catalyst point, or were some groups too large to be effective? Or yeah, I actually think some of our teams were too big. So when we got started, we put about five big firms and five little firms on every team, just because there was so much interest. Um, so some of them were actually just too big. They just, they had to figure out how to kind of resegment and reorient. Um, but, you know, I really loved the balance of the little and the big. They work so differently. They kind of approach the world very differently. Like oftentimes it was the small firms that were the ones like knocking on every door week after week. And it was some of the big firms that were able to leverage like donations from clients and get things installed and product manage the shit out of this. So, you know, there wasn't exactly like a right size. I think it was just the balance between small and big that was really meaningful. Um, I was curious to hear, you know, I, I know, uh, as a city and then these boroughs and it is it is fluid but have the efforts between uh that you know the neighborhoods and the surrounding communities um have it has it helped with integrate integration of of of, of community between you know setting up relationships and um uh just broadening the community in general I, I certainly hope so. I mean, I think 
what's kind of magical about New York is we're all so jammed together that there already is, you know, what I think one academic has described as differentiated solidarity. So there are these kind of distinct neighborhoods and yet they're often so close to one another or so overlapping that you might have kind of incredible cultural mass. And yet, you know, the Irish and the Italians across the street now are so well integrated, you can't, you can't tell the difference, right? Or maybe it's the Caribbean population and, um, and some of the kind of African Muslims of Bedside, for instance. And so um, I think that there's some, there's some great value in, in this project and sort of demonstrating what it's like to work across um, disciplines and identities and things like that. But, you know, we're still, this is a very small project in a very big city. You know, 100 businesses out of tens of thousands is, is, just, is just a start. Um. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I have more. I, I can keep going. OK. Um, I, uh, I was curious about, it seems easier to support a, a, a restaurant and, and building this structure for them to uh, seat outside. But how did, um, how are you able to help the other businesses um, that are not um, restaurants. Yeah, so there's, you know, there was a lot of the kind of protective um, surfaces, plexiglass, things like that, barriers in barbershops, uh, things like that. I think, you know, the, the big head scratching question was around ventilation guidance. So you can just imagine jammed on some of those streets, there's these tiny storefronts, they've got no air, they've got no windows. <laughs> And so working with some of the engineers to try and figure out, is it even possible to be safely habitable in restaurants and things like that has been kind of a major concern. Some of the like larger complexes, they've been doing, you know, circulation plans. They've been trying to figure out like, you know, seating formulas. I think things that you're probably all working on with your clients right now, just how to return to work, how to be safe, what kind of protocols do you need? Um, so it's, it's really just kind of a wide range of, of challenges and, and strategies to address them. How has, has the pandemic changed or, or shifted the focus of the design forum? Pretty significantly. I mean, I feel like, uh, aren't you having an identity crisis? I feel like we're all having a little bit of an identity crisis. You know, the forum, I didn't get to talk a little bit more about it more broadly, but in some ways it's a, it's a convener. It brings together, we host events 40 times a year, I'm sure, much like what Stephanie does at AI Spokane. So I think, you know, right now we're trying to figure out how can we do more of this applied work? How can we not just debate the future of the city and, and come together around different questions, but actually sort of apply some new thinking and, and build teams. So I think we're trying to figure out how to kind of build that as a permanent fixture of the work that we do. Um, and I think, you know, the board, my staff, they're all with me. I think everyone just feels like design actually has a new purpose in this moment. Um, and so we should just give it a shot and see if we can outlast the pandemic fatigue. Were there, were there endeavors or um, things that you guys were doing pre-pandemic that you've continued to do or um, would pick up again after uh, in the event that whatever oh, yeah. comes next? We do a ton. So we host webinars and things like that. We've been um, doing a major campaign to gather ideas for the next mayor of New York City. We're about to elect our next mayor. So we're still doing all of that. You know, it feels a little bit less potent right now. Maybe the mayor feels important because we actually do need a really strong leader after some tough years of kind of incompetence. But um, we're still doing that work. I think we're still excited about it. It's just, it feels a little bit better to actually be building something right now. I'm sure you guys feel like this too. Sometimes it's good to just put something up in the world. So I think we're all feeling that a little bit as well. Was there an equal willingness among the engineering firms to, to go into this? And how did they fit into that mix of five big and five small? Was that just the architectural or was that, was that yeah. AEC in general? 
the engineering firms were amazing. We worked mostly with Thornton Tomasetti and Arup, so some of the big guys, but uh, we also had transportation engineers uh, who were doing a lot of the kind of street planning work as well um, from Sam Schwartz Engineering. At, at, um, they were great. I think we, we actually had them as kind of wraparound experts, but that essentially meant that they were installed in every team. Engineering was a huge focus um, in part because a lot of the ventilation questions, but in part because a lot of the site planning, street, street planning exercises as well. So um, they were fabulous. We were thrilled to work with them. You know, with that in mind, how were the uh, planning and building departments? Do you have a significant uh, pushback or were people really willing to uh, just help you on your way? From, sorry, from whom? <clears throat> oh, the, the planning and building departments in the jurisdiction. Oh, yeah. Well, it's funny because I think uh, at the same time that everyone was having the identity crisis, a lot of those agencies were also having an identity crisis, right? Um, so, you know, what's nice about the way that the planning department is set up is that they actually have kind of a borough based office. And so it was really nice both to kind of work with them just to figure out all these evolving regulations, but also, you know, they were as interested in what we were learning as we were, right? They wanted to figure out how is this retail program going to work outdoors? What's the kind of uptake of the restaurants program in neighborhoods that have less resources? So I think they were really kind of grateful just to be in conversation with us. We kind of kept them posted um, and they consulted with us. Um, we didn't have to work too much with the Department of Buildings because um, in New York City, they're a little bit relegated to projects that are over 10 feet outdoors. And there wasn't too much that we were doing indoors. We had to work on a couple of things just to put up some walls and things like that. But, um, you know, it was nice to work with, like, we worked with the parks department to figure out if there was ways that we could activate public spaces. We worked with um, the health department who consulted with us. So, you know, I think there, you know, it was a lot of these like young staffers who also wanted to do some work in their neighborhoods. You know, a lot of them live in bed or live in Jackson Heights. And so wanted to make sure that we were, you know, helping a lot of the places that they hold dear. So it was, a, it was like a tremendously personal project even for a lot of the agencies. And there's the Zoom silence. Um, so I'd love to kind of like challenge yeah. you guys and just ask, you know, how are you guys thinking about how does your practice change after the pandemic? Is there a way in which you can incorporate this kind of work or a little bit more pro bono or work in underinvested communities that, that you're feeling right now? Is that the kind of thing that you're just, just talking about in your firms and, and figuring out the structure? Does anyone want to chime in? Um, I can at least speak for um, my firm and and well, slightly and um, and what I've seen it that again, it's the identity crisis and and managing um, you know how in in the moment, how are we going to do this? just internally um, with all the changes and and continue with our production. And I think there was like a, a scramble at the beginning, like we've all felt. And um, there's been time for adjustment. And that's, I, I just don't know if, if we're um, reaching out to our communities as, as much as we could be. And I think there's room for improvement there. And so that's why I wanted to hear you, you speak um, to, and so we can discuss this because I, I, I think there is room for improvement uh, from that, that standpoint. Yeah. I'm curious to know too, like, I feel like uh, in New York City, things are really hard they're really hard to get done anything. There's just like so many layers of regulation and building process. And I think one thing that was really lovely about the pandemic was we sort of said, okay, let's take a step back from that. Let's see what we can roll out quickly. I'm curious if you're seeing that kind of spirit in Spokane and is that something that you can kind of harness toward, toward the public good? Yeah. 
You know, I, I, uh, I'm not actively practicing. I retired about 10 years ago. I am doing some interviews for, uh, I'm doing more freelance writing and I've been interviewing architectural firms and on the West Coast. And one of the questions I've asked each of them as I've done these little short case studies is, how did the pandemic affect your practice? And for, for some of them, they had already gone um, all virtual office anyway, so it didn't really change a whole lot. And for others, they were, I'm interviewing people who are using cloud-based uh, design team software anyway. So it didn't, for them to go, um, to go virtual didn't, didn't make a huge difference. They, they missed the camaraderie, but it didn't affect practice that much, which is, which is an interesting thing to, to hear them all telling me. Um, and I will confess that I honestly tuned in today because um, I live in a completely different setting. Um, I, I, one of the reasons that I, I uh, retired early is that I wanted to be able to do a little bit more things that are just sort of helping out in my community. But my community, I live three miles outside of a village of about 100 people. So it's in a county with four people per square mile. There's, there's as many people in the Empire State Building on a full day, full work day than there is in my whole county. So uh, it's a completely different setting. And I really wanted to listen to what you had to say to just to understand how the other side feels because the, the pandemic has a completely different uh, feel to it here. And I, it's hard for me from a old farmhouse on 80 acres, um, you know, I keep trying to put myself in the head of somebody who's in New York City stuck in a, a 300 square foot apartment and who feels like they can't actually leave for three months. That's, that's like really weird from my point of view. And so I appreciate your, your describing your communities and your neighborhoods. And that's a, a helpful travelogue for me. Yeah, it's, it was, uh, it was an interesting year. It was an interesting year. We're all trapped in our 300 square foot apartment. So I think we're all trying to figure out how to do a little good. Yeah, I live in a small town too. I, uh, I live in Leavenworth. And uh, I practiced in Spokane and I practiced in Seattle for a number of years. And I ended up over here three years ago. When I was in Seattle, I worked at a firm that there was a strong um, sort of commitment to pro bono work and sort of social justice, so, sort of social warrior work. Um, but now I work in a firm where it's more, we're, we're a destination community. So people come over, for, we're very in town. We get a lot of tourism, uh, I think three, four million people a year. So, and a lot of people during the pandemic have been starting moving here from Seattle. And so we've actually doubled in size. There was this big scramble at the beginning of the pandemic. Oh my God, we're six people and we're all, it's going to be 2008 all over again. What do we do here? And so we, we've been scrambling and scrambling. I think I've been as busy here as I was in Seattle <laughs> when I first moved over here. My, my workload dropped substantially. And so it's, it's been good, but we have a lot of sort of wealthier clients and we build a lot of houses and really nice sort of commercial projects. Uh, we have heavy workload, but um, in my mind, I always go back to that sort of social justice side of being a professional and providing to the community and having that strong ethic in my mind. So as we grow in size and we talk about where we're going with the work we do, um, sure, we're in a small town, but there's needs everywhere. Everyone has a need, an unfulfilled need. And so how do you start to think about providing that? Well, the first thing is you have to reach out and find that need. Um, and obviously you guys were, have been pretty good at, at determining that. So maybe not a question there uh, as much as just a comment. <laughs> no, it's amazing. I mean, I read about the boom towns of, yes, the Idaho and Washington, it's pretty amazing. It's like the fastest growing part of the country right now. Um, but that's, it's, you know, that's why everyone becomes architects, right? To build a better world. So I, it doesn't surprise me that there are a lot of people that wanna figure out how to, to add this to their practice. So my invitation is like, I was amazed at how easy it was to find the right partners. They're just, they're out there and they know what they need and they actually have a vision. It's, it's kind of just providing your, your tools and your resources to get it done. Yeah, I know uh, that the influx of people um, to you know smaller towns that we've been feeling is is uh, 
and I, I think it's being proactive and this discussion helps um, with adjusting our infrastructure with growth that comes so fast. And um, I know that that's been um, a real challenge and, and instead of uh, reacting, um, trying to be proactive in solutions and, and adjustments and keeping you know, equity in mind as our neighborhoods do grow and change, so. Well, this is kind of interesting because we've been preparing for a, um, another, Sulani and I, another presentation on um, the rebuilding of the Malden, um, the town of Malden after their fire. And they, uh, I think this will be a little bit of a continuation of the topic of moving to small towns, building quickly, um, and trying to plan quickly. So it'd be a good one for if people are interested in continuing the conversation to, to tune into that one as well. And um, we just have a couple more comments in from the chat. Um, it's, uh, it's from Erin, um, ALS, ALSC, the firm she works for. Um, they were really trying to help restaurants find um, design outdoor areas, but found it difficult uh, to get interest from the restaurants themselves. And so um, I, I think there's some lessons learned from your presentation, Daniel, that uh, we can apply to our community as well. And then, um, and then yeah, NAC has um, uh, been looking into uh, social equity and um, community issues, especially uh, youth trauma uh, that uh, are one of our internal committees have been diving into. So um, I guess that's some update of, of what firms around here have uh, uh, been working on. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing to see how everyone's pivoting in this moment. When you talk about restaurants and outdoor areas, it's funny, New York City also has a program that just helps anyone with a restaurant get an outdoor space. And I feel like we probably are helping as many restaurants because the kinds of universal programs often don't work. You kind of have to go to communities. You can't just expect them to come to you. Um, so, so totally think about like neighborhoods and pilots, what you can start, you know, skip a stone, see how many, uh, see how many more restaurants you could build. And uh, yeah, I mean, Get, get as many young people involved in architecture as possible. We need as many bright minds building the future of Spokane and, and New York City and, and the rest of the country. So I think if you can figure out a way to get people inspired, that's as good as it gets. Um, I guess we're getting close to six o'clock. Um, Stephanie, did you have um, a couple items you wanted to address? Sure. If there are any any further questions, I don't want to cut any any off this discussion. It's, yeah. But if there isn't, I'll go ahead and share my screen again because. Um, well, maybe we should. Does is anyone else have anything to add, or comment, or share, or questions? Well, I just wanted to say it's uh, pretty inspiring to see the work that you're doing, um, Daniel, in New York, and being able to, to get partners together and, and recognize the need and get the team together, but also gain the trust of people who wanted these things to happen to help their businesses and their communities. I mean, it's kind of a large feat because I think what I, what I see in, in the comments here is that we're also suffering from a lack maybe of trust in a way or trust from businesses seeing that maybe something like this would work for them. Um, not being sure about that, but also was there that outreach by any teams to, to even do something like that here? So it's just pretty impressive what you all have done out there. And, um, good presentation, really appreciate it. Thanks Angela. Okay. Anyone else? Um, Daniel, I just uh, wanted to thank you for taking time out of the day, and I know it's late there, and um, I really appreciate it. I've it's it was very um, inspiring, 
And I wanted to thank you for um, your leadership and, um, and it's a, a wonderful thing to see uh, an organization and a person that's uh, committed to uh, improving their community. Thanks, Georgia. It's really nice to be connected with you all. I'm going to leave my email in the chat. You should feel free to reach out anytime and uh, hope you'll come visit us in New York. I'm happy to let you know when I'm next in Spokane. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. I actually do want to get out there sometime. I saw this. Uh, this is a non sequitur, but saw this documentary on a place um, it's called Carmine Street Guitars. Um, and uh, it's, you know, a couple of people making, you know, bespoke guitars out of reclaimed wood from um, demolished um, buildings around New York and all this. And it's, it was really a cool film. Um, definitely going to be one of my stops when I get out there. Very cool. Well, yeah. My old boss uh, now is making lighting fixture made out of the old Coney Island boardwalk. So I'm happy cool. to send you that stuff too. There's some pretty, pretty wild stuff. Nice. Well, if there aren't any more comments, you can see by my, the screen that I shared, we still have seven more events for Architecture Month. And um, so I encourage you to participate, log on to our website and sign up. Lots of good credits to be had and lots of lively discussions. Um, tomorrow is um, the 1AECAA presentation, how to supercharge your award submissions workshop. Um, anybody that is involved in putting together words, uh, award submissions, whether they're the principal, the project manager, or the marketing person, this is a great presentation. John Kane was one of our uh, design award jurors and has a lot of great things to say along with um, we have um, a gentleman from the GJC construction editor who does a, who's a perennial juror as well. So um, sign up for that. That happens tomorrow. NAC is also uh, doing a virtual tour of, of Lake Stevens next week. Um, Trinity NAC is doing a resilience in healthcare. Um, we also have uh, BEC of Spokane uh, that's coordinated a great presentation on the new paradigm for building enclosure delivery performance and durability. Um, we have the Pine Creek uh, Community Restoration Recovering from the Malden Fire, which Kathy Russell and uh, spoke about uh, earlier, just a few minutes ago, uh, that would help to continue this conversation we've had tonight. Um, and finally, then we're going to get into some project work. Um, the Riverfront Park Ice Age Flood Program, we're doing a virtual presentation followed by our absolutely first in-person um, uh, event since pan the pandemic hit, and we're actually gonna do a tour of that playground. Um, you're welcome to join uh, that tour if you are an AIA, IIDA, or a ASLA member. That's what we're limiting to because we do have to limit the number of people and we will be following all COVID requirements um, as of that date. So that's what I have. I do have one final announcement to say that Dustin Hoffman is our award winner for the $50 gift card. Dustin will go ahead and make sure and get that um, card in the mail too, you'll get an email um, of where to mail it. And uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for all of you for coming, Daniel, especially for staying up late and sharing all the wisdom that you're doing in New York City. And I just think any city, large or small, can can learn from um, just reaching out to your neighbors and, and getting a group and, and, and rolling your sleeves up and, and getting it done. So thank you for, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Okay. With that, if there aren't any further, this doesn't have to be formal, there aren't any further questions, I'll go ahead and say adios and we'll see you at the next presentation and everybody have a great evening. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Stephanie, are you sticking around? It looks like. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I thought I hit end. end. Uh, okay. All right. I'll, uh, I can leave. I just didn't know if Daniel.